I'm here with John Fullerton. He's a former managing director at J.P. Morgan, and he was once a CEO of a hedge fund. Now, well, now he is the director of the Capital Institute, an organization that he founded that sees a different sort of future for capital in the world. John, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Great to be with you. You were once happily trundling along a very successful career track in the financial world. Mm. To start with, why did you decide to go into finance? Mm. Uh, and then secondly, why did you s decide to leave? Well, I, I, uh, the, the story on how I got into finance is kind of an interesting one. It was not the classic, you know, boy goes to Wall Street to make fortune uh, kind of story. In fact, when I went to Wall Street in 1982, I went to a commercial bank called Morgan Guarantee Trust Company. Um, at the time, and it was really uh, inspired, my, my decision was inspired by a course I took in college. I had been an international relations major, and the course was called The Economics of International Relations, and the thesis was that global finance and economics would determine the course of international relations in the future rather than politics. So that really resonated. Um, that idea turned out to be true, but certainly not in the way that I had anticipated. Um, but I went into finance, I went into banking really to learn about international economics and finance. And I had this idea, sort of vague idea, that someday I would get trained in banking and then go work at the World Bank someday and, and put the knowledge to, to good use. And at what point did you say, I got to leave, this is not okay? I, um, I had this idea, even at Morgan, one of the last things I did there, I did some venture capital investing for the firm. And I had this idea of aligning investment capital with social and environmental purpose. So, for example, my first investment in Morgan Capital was to invest in the Edison Schools Project, which is a for-profit charter school management business. And so this idea of aligning capital with social purpose um, really started while I was at Morgan. And so I explored that after I left and, and did what's now called impact investing with some of my own funds and, and working on some projects with other people, particularly focused on the, the food and, and water issues. Um, I began to learn a lot about the ecosystem crisis. And, um, and it was really only after studying uh, the, the, the ecological crisis as a systemic issue that the, the, um, the conclusion of that study kind of led me back to first the economy. The economy is driving this ecosystem crisis. And then as a finance person, finance drives the economy. So if the economy is creating the problem and finance is driving the economy, then it, it sort of led back to finance. And this was before the financial collapse. And I would begin to explore these ideas with some of my friends, and people would look at me like, you know, you've lost your marbles. And then the financial collapse happened. And then suddenly, um, people didn't think I was so crazy anymore. How do you define the crisis? How do you see it now? The, the financial crisis? Um, I think it's in its um, kind of long gestation period. I, I think we've had this initial eruption in, back in 2008, 2009. Um, that seemed to have stabilized, but only through unprecedented uh, central bank uh, intervention. So in many ways, the system is now on, on some kind of a uh, support system that is tenuous at best. And of course, what's going on in Europe is, is um, nothing less than frightening. And what about the biosphere? Well, the biosphere has been left out of the conversation. And, um, and in many ways, you know, what our work at the Capital Institute is about is looking at a different context uh, of our eco economic challenges. And the, um, the unfortunate truth I've come to believe is that we've reached the logical um, conclusion of this expansionist economic paradigm. This is not a new idea. There are people been writing about this for decades. Um, but the notion that exponential growth can go on indefinitely on a finite planet is in violation with arithmetic and basic physics. And yet our economic ideology, and I call it an ideology quite intentionally, suggests that there are no limits to growth. And, uh, and again, as a finance person, if there are boundaries or limits to growth and investment drives growth, then the implications are that we need to think very Mm. very differently about how investment flows. I've spoken with the um, economist, physicist, environmentalist Vandana Shiva from mm. India about this and talked about the need for a new kind of economics in the way that we have mm. developed a new understanding of physics. Mm. Um, the two are related. Mm. Talk a bit about 
how we got mired in a sort mm. of Newtonian idea of economics, what that has done to our idea of the role of finance, and finally, what might a quantum e economics mm. look like? Well, those are hard questions, Start but, with but you're, um, <laughs> you're, you've raised an issue which very few people that work in finance are even aware of, I would suspect, which is that neoliberal economics is grounded in Newtonian physics. And um, there's a great book by Bob Nadeau that explained this, um, and, and he's a, um, in fact, he's just written a new paper about this. But um, uh, very few people are aware that the, um, uh, the early uh, classical economists were really philosophers and trying to equate uh, to the natural laws of physics, and these were Newtonian laws at the time, they believed that there must be some equivalent laws that govern the economic sphere. So uh, Adam Smith's invisible hand being the most um, significant example of that. And as the economics profession progressed, um, that flawed foundation was never really gone mm -hmm. and, and revisited. And so when, we've had, when we had the advances in quantum physics, no one ever in economics said, oh, wait a second, that means we'll need to rethink everything about economics. And, um, and so where, where that leaves us is we're sort of up in the sky in a very abstract world where mathematics has dominated the, the economics profession, and yet the foundation is really not grounded in anything solid. So we're lost. So let's talk about the, the irony that you would have the Rio Plus 20 conference happening mm. with all of the people talking about the future of the planet at the same time that the G20 meeting is happening in Mexico with all the world leaders talking about economic development. Mm. I mean, if you had been looking for a clear display of how these two things are disconnected, there right. is one. Right. How do we bring them together? And where do you see it happening? So the, the big idea that, that I learned from a man named Alan Savory, who is now a, a partner of mine on an investment project, is holism. And holism was coined by Jan Smuts um, at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, Einstein wrote Smuts a letter saying this idea and his idea of relativity would be the two most important ideas in, that would determine the course of civilization or something to that effect. And the idea of holism is that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And just as you pointed out, we have economic policymakers focused on the financial crisis as if the financial crisis is disconnected from the ecosystem crisis. And the solution to the financial crisis and our economic challenges, unemployment and depression in places like Greece, is to spur economic growth. But economic growth, at its root, is the cause of many of the ecosystem crises. But economic growth is putting people to work, is creating jobs. That's all good stuff that we're fighting for, isn't it? So we need to figure out a way to create full employment without being dependent on perpetual material throughput, the growth of material throughput. And that, I believe, is the challenge of the 21st century. There's no, that's not a trivial question. And I'm, I'm uh, very um, uh, aware of the challenge of trying to do this without simply getting back on the, the growth bandwagon. So and, and when we're in a depression, we certainly need to stimulate growth to get back to some kind of equilibrium. Level. So some kind of growth doesn't involve using stuff? Growth of, of non, so, so te the technology industry is, is, is very unmaterial, you know, very little material throughput is related to technology, to the news media, to, to programs like this. They don't generate, they generate data, they don't generate mm -hmm. Um, need for iron and cement and steel. So we need to shift the economy for sure to a much more dematerialized economy. And some of this will come through technological innovation, but some of it will come through a realistic assessment of how much is enough and where, where we need to be, be more um, thrifty with the use of materials. So there's what we're making, but isn't there also how it's being made and the power relations between those doing the making or the economy and that financial world that you talked about mm. that has very different um, types of goals and, mm. and agendas than, than the planet maybe. Yeah, so the, the premise of finance is, is compound interest, uh, what Einstein called the most powerful force in the universe. Now compound interest, when, when that drives perpetual economic growth, is, is in conflict with the laws of thermodynamics at some point. Wait, explain what compound interest is in this context. So, so compound interest is the idea that if I invest my money today, um, I'll earn some return. Let's say I put it in the bank and earn interest of 3%. Remember those days when you used to earn interest on bank account. Um, 
Compound interest is the idea that at the end of the year, if I put in $100, I'll have $103. And if I invest $103, at the end of the next year, I'll have 103 times 3%. And at the end of the next year, it keeps compounding at 3%. And that looks like exponential growth, which is the root cause of the problem uh, with the biosphere, which is that we can't have an economy fueled by exponential growth in money um, that, that grows material throughput at an ex exponential rate. So to your point, finance is probably the most disconnected or reductionist practice within, uh, well, I don't know the most, it's certainly a, a highly reductionist practice. We, we segregate risk into simple buckets of risk and manage them separately rather than thinking of them holistically. And we think about risk in finance and financial investments as being the financial risk, the, the volatility of the financial assets. And we don't pay attention to the real investment decisions and the feedback loops they generate mm. in the real economy. So if Walmart expands, to put it very concretely, that means they pave over a huge area of farmland um, and, and generate demand for cheap goods that come from all, all around the world that all has an ecological footprint. But the investment to do that is only measured in, in terms of its financial mm. um, consequences. So how do we change it? And where do you see initiatives out there that are hopeful or give you hope? Well, certainly one of the really hopeful areas, and it's small and it's fringe, but it's growing, is a, is a field called impact investing. And these are investors such as myself who um, look at the problems in the world and look to create um, uh, businesses and social enterprises that attack these problems. So the purpose of the investment is actually to address a social or an ecological challenge. You don't and, want to make money? Uh, Many of these are for-profit models, but the mission is not to optimize the financial return. The mission is to uh, earn an adequate financial return for the risk while optimizing or maximizing the social or environmental impact. Mm -hmm. And, and this is a, again, this is not the mainstream yet, um, but it is moving into the mainstream. Uh, firms like Morgan Stanley now have impact investment funds. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole long story about how real that is and, and what the, the impact is. Um, but it's, it's a sign of, of hope, I think. You talked at the very beginning about the power of finance in decision making. Um, I'm happy to hear that JP Morgan is doing social impact investing. That was Morgan Stanley, actually. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Morgan Stanley but, is but doing JP impact But JP Morgan wrote investing. a research report on it, so they're, they're focused on the field. But if they still have the same power in Washington to block regulation mm. of these other areas, what's changing in terms of power relations? Yeah. So, nothing yet. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a mountain of change that needs to occur so that the real flow of capital, which is, which is banks, institutional investors, is, is redirected away from this short-term speculative economy and directed into real investment that actually shifts the characteristics or the quality of the economy that we have. So we need capital to flow into sustainable energy, alternative energy, and not into highly speculative short-term um, housing bubbles, which then when they collapse, create the tremendous um, social dysfunction, and the need to then stimulate growth in order to recover the, um, you know, the, the unemployment rate. So there, as, as painful as the financial collapse has been for so many people, it also creates this huge need to regenerate growth in order to get people employed again, which creates more of the ecosystem st strain than we that we can no longer afford. So it's got a, a, a really a double cost to it that isn't really factored in yet. How would governance need to change? So governance is a huge challenge in a now interdependent global world where many of these ecosystem crises, um, some of them are local, um, like the pollution of a river is a local issue, but many of them, most notably climate change, carbon in the atmosphere is a global problem. And we're not organized globally. We actually are organized by nation state, and nation states operate in their interests. And so we don't really have a solution to how do we, how do we organize and govern in, in, in these global issues. And, and you know, the, the, the difficulty of a, of a conference like Rio only shows how, how challenging this will be. Talk to your colleagues for a minute, John. People coming up today through economics training and business schools have learned one idea of what their role is. It's to get a, as big a return on their money as they can. Mm. Um, there's no difference between investing in something like Instagram that 
employs eight people and GM that employs 800. Uh, what's your message to them about their role in the society at this moment? Mm. I mean, I, I, think, I think we will look back uh, and, and our grandchildren will ask us, what were you thinking when you were investing in some high frequency trading thing when you knew that we needed to shift the entire energy system of the planet off of coal and into alternative energy? What were you thinking? So redefine self-interest. Yeah, you can redefine self-interest and you can actually think beyond self and understand that we're all connected and that my self-interest actually is the common interest. And I, and I think we are, we are in the process of shifting from a totally um, self-oriented uh, individualistic culture to one that by necessity will understand the, um, that we're all connected and all uh, in this boat together, so to speak. Let's hope so. John Fullerton, hmm. thanks so much. Thank you.